welcome back to another episode of Morgan's Pop Talks, breaking down the biggest Hollywood headlines in reality TV and pop culture. First and foremost, I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know I did. It was so relaxing. We didn't do anything. Oh, isn't that the best? We had absolutely no plans. We saw like three people, David and I, and two of them were my parents. So it was just the best. Um, the only thing that happened that went wrong on Thanksgiving is I uh, found out I had a cavity two days before Thanksgiving. Not ideal, you know, especially as a 29 year old. I don't know what kind of stigma around cavities I've created in my head, but I thought that 29 year olds didn't get cavities. I thought that was only for like children, but I have been quickly educated on the fact that 29 year olds can in fact get cavities and I have them. So I went to the dentist, dentist, ugh, just a horrible experience, no matter how old you are, no matter how many times you've been to the dentist. And then I get done at the dentist and she tells me she can't fill my cavity until April. April. <laughs> so, uh, that's what I'm working with. Right now, if I uh, need to take a little swig of water, I did just take three Advil because it hurts, man. I'm like, I can't deal with this until April. So send T's and P's for your girl. But listen, if that's the biggest life stress that I have at the moment, then we are good to go. Um, Something else that I should probably tell you, we have so much to get in today. I don't know why I'm going on a rant about my cavities, but um, also I should tell you, cause it's kind of been on the internet, but I don't think that I've officially said that David and I had to, um, postpone our wedding. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. As you know, my lovely fiance is not American. He's South African and British. He has a dual passport for both of those countries. Doesn't have an American passport is not a citizen. So we're waiting on his visa. Um, when we got engaged, we were told it would take six months for him to get his fiance visa. Uh, we got a receipt back in May saying that it would be 13 months. And now on the website, it says 16 months. So um, very, very long story short, we, we can't get married without that visa. It's legal. Um, we also can't have a celebration. You know, like we we can't keep our August 18th wedding day and just not have a ceremony because it could be considered visa fraud. And that's not what you want to do going into a marriage if you want to ensure that he's able to stay here forever, which is what we want. So just send some T's and P's on that front too. I had some lovely listeners tell me um, to reach out to my local congressman, which is what I've done. And they seem to be helping a little bit. So time will tell if if they end up helping us move this thing along uh, any quicker. But yeah, so those are my life updates. I'll keep you updated as best as I can. But let's get into this week's pop three. These are the biggest headlines in reality TV and pop culture. Let's start with the Kim Ye divorce. It's final. This has been going on forever. You remember Kim filed for divorce in February of 2021. We're almost going two years into this thing. They were together uh, for seven years. This past March, she was declared legally single, but obviously they had some stuff to work out. They had uh, like 21 homes that they had to figure out who was getting the 11 and who's getting 10. You know, it's just absolutely ridiculous. If you can't tell, I'm a little mad at Kim right now, and we'll get into that in the deep dive. So if I come across a little snarky today, that's why. Um, the two of them will have joint custody of the kids. Um, they'll split education and security costs amongst them, and then Kanye will pay Kim $200,000 a month in child support. Kanye is keeping his childhood home in Chicago and his $60 million Malibu home, as well as several other SoCal properties. Um, he's also keeping his Wyoming ranch. And I guess he has a bachelor pad in Belgium. OK, uh, he's going to transfer the title of the 3,650 square foot five bedroom home he bought next to Kim. Kim will keep the Idaho property she owns, as well as the $60 million Hidden Hills Estates. She currently lives in with their four children. That's the one we see on the show all the time. And then she'll also keep another property in Riverside, California. While Kim has their kids the majority of the time 
Um, they do have joint custody. And here's an interesting tidbit from the Kenya divorce that you might not know about their agreement. If a dispute arises between Kim and Kanye, they have agreed to participate in mediation for at least three hours. If one of them declines to engage, the other gets sole decision making power. You know, Kim Kardashian put that in there because Kanye is never showing up to the courtroom. He's always going MIA. So they just penciled that in there. Uh, the children can't move more than 60 miles away from their mom's home before they finish high school or turn 19, whichever comes first, uh, without the other parents consent or a court order. Also, we all remember uh, the infamous birthday party that Kanye claims he was not invited to. Um, now it's in writing that each parent will have access to the kids on special days, such as their birthday. So glad it's all done and dusted. Moving on to our next couple, Greg and Victoria on the Vile Files. I'm going to give you the really skimmed down version because that podcast was an hour and 20 minutes of listening to Victoria go, eh. I was like, stop. She did it like five times. Ugh. I'm like, okay, what are you doing? It was an hour and 20 minutes. I'm so feisty. I woke up mid nap. Like that's when, you know, you don't get your whole sleep out and you're just grumpy. So I'm sorry to Victoria. That was mean, but that would be a correct prediction, by the way, on MPT. We all knew that Greg and Victoria were going to go on the vile files to tell their side of the story. And there's another correct prediction by Morgie that we're going to get to later, but I just from the get go have been really uninvested in the whole Greg, Victoria, Johnny thing, because truthfully, I don't think that Johnny and Victoria should have been engaged to begin with. And that's a lot of a lot of people are skipping over that fact. We saw so many red flags go down between the two of them on Paradise. And people are supposed to be surprised that it imploded three weeks after they got back. I'm not surprised. Um but this would be another pr correct prediction by me listening to this podcast. I said that I believed because, you know, Greg and Victoria, uh, they weren't they didn't get together before paradise. It's not like they were making out all over the place, but they did have interest in each other. And I said, I bet Victoria thought and wanted Greg to come to paradise. And in this um, podcast interview, they confirmed that. She said, we talked before the show. I was asking him, are you going to paradise? He said he wasn't because he was on and off again with this girl in Paris. And I still wanted to go. So that was my prediction. I said, they're talking. Victoria wants to be on TV. Victoria wants to fall in love with Greg on paradise and live happily ever after. That didn't happen. And then Victoria met Johnny. They got engaged. So because of that, when they came home from paradise, Victoria said that she needed to call Greg to clear the air because they all run around in the same group of friends. Johnny's friends with Andrew. Andrew is best friends with Greg. You know, they're all friends with Nick and Natalie going to the parties. And I'm thinking, actually, Victoria, you don't. What what would you need to clear the air with Greg about? If you should be clearing the air to anyone, it should be your fiance, Johnny. Like, what are you going to say to Greg? I know we talked for two weeks before paradise, but I got engaged and I hope everything is cool. If it is what you say it was, and it was only you two talking, you don't owe him that you guys were never anything more than friends. Why would you owe him any sort of explanation? So that's one part where I really don't see where Victoria is coming from. She does talk about this um, big explosive fight and we've gotten snippets of it here and there. They were at a happy couples weekend, which is where um, bachelor nation stars go to be like incognito and spend time together while the season is either getting ready to air or airing. And that's when um, Johnny called her the bleeping bleep. And she admitted to throwing the wine glass. She did not admit to throwing a wine glass at Johnny, which was the narrative that was put out there by reality, Steve. Um, but she did say she opened the door. Johnny was outside and she threw the wine glass outside and it combusted. She's like, look, I didn't want to be in a toxic relationship. If you have this guy calling me a bleep and bleep and I'm throwing wine glasses, we need to go our separate ways. And I 100% agree with her in that you're allowed to break up with somebody because the relationship is toxic. It doesn't matter if it's one week, two weeks, three weeks, like they clearly weren't good together. 
and you know she wanted out of that relationship she said they called off the engagement but still went to couples therapy uh they were still trying to work it out although victoria says she was done and checked out of the relationship long before johnny was and maybe that's where there was some confusion to where she thought you know she made it clear that things were done and dusted but johnny maybe needed more closure and she wanted to give him that so you know i've been there with uh my some of my ex-boyfriends where it's like um you you say to yourself oh if i could just say this one more thing to him maybe i'll feel better about us breaking up or if i can just get this off my chest maybe things will be better um so she said maybe johnny was feeling that way and in some way keeping his own hope alive but to her it was done she also said she felt misled by him on the beach about his job his goals him wanting to be engaged so she was saying on the podcast that uh, his story about his job kept changing. It was he owned a bar, then he managed a bar, and then they got home and he was only bartending, and then he wasn't there at all. He wanted to be a rapper. He was in real estate. She said he didn't really know what was going on. Um, and she said, you know, I wanted to support him in whatever it what whatever his passion was, whether that is real estate, whether that is owning a bar. But she just said that his story kept changing um, and that he wasn't set in his career. She also said she was surprised by watching Gabby season back about him not wanting to be engaged. Um, this also I don't get because as a viewer, we all saw that Johnny didn't want to be engaged, right? He said it multiple times. Like, did she just miss that part of the conversation? Did she not hear it because she didn't want to hear it? Which goes back to my original point. These two had no business being engaged from the jump talked about it last week on the podcast when Johnny's saying I hate who I see when I look in the mirror I'm my own worst enemy does not sound like somebody who a needs to be on reality tv and b needs to be engaged to somebody also why aren't people mad that Johnny is openly admitting both on a season of the bachelor and bachelor in paradise that he isn't ready to be engaged I mean wouldn't any other time, it's this guy's here for the wrong reasons, but you hear none of that. This whole situation just really aggravates me. So um, she said that they called it quits officially on September 20th. She called Greg. They spent the night. Uh, timing was off between the two of them. They were texting for weeks. And then that trip to Rome, which happened at the end of October, is when they officially got together. Okay. So, I mean, it is what it is take it or leave it at this point. You know, she said, I should be able to move on from a toxic, toxic relationship. And I agree 110%. I just don't believe that she didn't know that he was not ready to be engaged because we all knew it. And we saw one, one hundredth of what went on, on the beach. Did they just take every every little snippet of Johnny saying he didn't want to be engaged and put it into our hour episodes? Because it's like, if it's clear for us and we only saw 1% of what happened on the beach, I just have a hard time believing that it wasn't clear for Victoria. And she made it clear that she wanted to be engaged at the end of this. I'm just wondering why. And there's the tea on that. Okay, coming in number three, and this story literally broke as I sat down to start recording the podcast, so I'm sorry if it's all over the place because I have no notes, and I'm literally just going off of this page six article. Um, married Good Morning America host TJ Holmes and Amy Robach allegedly had a months-long affair, so this is very juicy, very interesting. Um, so it says Mary GMA co-anchors TJ Holmes and Amy Robach left their partners after an alleged months long affair. Page six has confirmed a source close to page six said their romance began in March around the same time they were training together for the New York city half marathon. Uh, the repair who or the, the pair who reportedly left their spouses in August were spotted canoodling in bars near ABC news back back in May. And then according to one staffer, the couple has gone to extreme lengths to hide their affair. This source says they have a very cozy relationship on air, but that is what is expected. But they were very careful behind the scenes to keep their affair a secret. The producers at Good Morning America are shocked to hear that they are having an affair. So that was on page six. And then of course, you know, Daily Mail is always 
got the tea. And I mean, wow, these video or not videos, these pictures are very telling of these two. Uh, November 13th, they're both seen getting out of car and it looks like TJ smacking her on the behind. That's a little inappropriate. November 10th, they're out at a bar drinking, laughing. Um, they're seen together walking around the streets of New York City. November 17th, same, same thing. And then there's one where they're holding hands um, just a couple days ago on November 28th. So they're seen like walking around New York City together. And then there's a photo of them in the car and they are holding hands. Um, so according to these reports, and it's still early, it seems that Amy and TJ left their spouses in August. Um, and I don't know about TJ, but I do know that Amy has children. So... Oh, scandalous, scandalous. I always just find it so um, shocking, I think, when when people in such high places have affairs like Good Morning America, because they come across as like just these wholesome all American news reporters that have their whole life together. And really, they're just cheating on their um, husbands and wives. So that's interesting. OK. Oh, it's going to be another deep one today. Take a deep breath because oh, I talked about this earlier this week on my Patreon uh, about Balenciaga and we're getting into the deep dive now. Um, if you listen to that, it was just all my initial shock, uh, but we're really going to dig deep into it now with uh, key players behind the scenes, you know, the, the parents involvement, what's going on with Kim Kardashian. So let's get to our deep dive question. Hey Morgan, I love a deep dive on the Balenciaga scandal. I feel like more and more stuff comes out every day and it's getting really disturbing. Do you think Kim will ever actually cut ties? Love the pod and love you like a sis. Love you like a sis as always. By the way, before I dive into this because I'm just going to be a little shameless for a second. You know, Spotify Wrapped came out yesterday. So if you have MPT on your top podcast and you want to post it on your Instagram story, like do it because I'll repost it and it makes me happy. Okay, let's get into it. The deep dive all about Balenciaga. We're starting from the beginning. We're going all the way down what celebrities you need to be mad at, uh, what Kim Kardashian is doing, the work. So Balenciaga initially was under hot water for two campaigns. One ad, the first ad included a child model standing with a teddy bear that was wearing black leather and chains. Um, that a lot of people said looked like BDSM apparel. It's funny because in Balenciaga statements, they're like, uh, you know, people have labeled this BDSM apparel. Nope. It's leather chains, harnesses. It's BDSM apparel. Um, so that was like strike one, right? Everyone was like, what the heck is this? Strike two, even weirder. Um, there was a campaign, different campaign that included a pile of legal documents, one of which included the text of a Supreme Court decision related to um, the distribution of child pornography. The two ad campaigns in question were Balenciaga's Christmas 2022 campaign shot by photographer uh, Gabrielle Gallimberti and the spring 2023 campaign shot by Chris Maggio. So two different campaigns, two different sets, two different set designers, two different photographers. So the Christmas campaign was the one featuring the teddy bears in that SNM style leather gear. The bears are actually plush handbags that Balenciaga sells in the shape of teddy bears. Uh, the leather straps, you know, it just it's weird. I mean, you look at it and it's weird. And I, I, it's so hard to navigate this conversation, honestly, because even when I first saw this, I was like appalled. I still am. I'm disgusted. It needs to just be done and dusted. But then you have people out there that are like, oh, people are over exaggerating. And you start to question yourself. And it's like, cause I have thought about this nonstop since it happened. What was it? Like, a day before Thanksgiving, two days before Thanksgiving. And by today, I'm like, am I over exaggerating? And then I'm like, no, you are not over exaggerating. If you're pissed about this too, you're not over exaggerating. So don't let that seep into your brain, especially this ad is not the product is not for kids. The product is for adults. So why is the main focus of this Christmas campaign a child, right? 
So people are asking, what about the parents? What were the parents doing? There was this one article that came out. I believe it was in the Daily Mail of one of the parents saying, oh, you guys are blowing this out of proportion. My kid had a great time on the set. Well, the parents actually work for Balenciaga. So it's not like these um, child models were at a casting call and whatever. They're literally Balenciaga employees, which I think is a little bit um, maybe... <sighs> I guess they would just be more susceptible, right? Like if if somebody works in Balenciaga and they see what's going on and they've been around it for how many years, they're like, yeah, they don't mean anything by it or whatever. Maybe they do know what's going on and they just don't care. The photographer spoke out in that campaign and said, I'm not in a position to comment Balenciaga's choices, but I must trust that I was not entitled in whatsoever manner to neither choose the products nor the models, not the combination of the same. As a photographer, I was only solely requested to lit the given scene and take the shots according to my signature style. His signature style is photographs of most of them that I have seen are kids with children's toys around them. I have seen some uh, of his photos. Honest, you want me to be 100% with you? The only other one that I've seen is like an adult surrounded by guns, like big guns. So I mean, make of that what you will, but the direction, he said the direction of the campaign and shooting are not on the hands of the photographer. Okay. So then we get to this spring campaign and it features an upcoming Balenciaga, Balenciaga collaboration with Adidas. And the campaign featured the bag in an office environment, sitting on top of a pile of papers, folded a laptop and legal documents. The legal documents are where the trouble comes. It's a text from a Supreme Court decision related to the Protect Act, which was a 2003 federal law that states child pornography is not protected by free speech. So let's just keep in the back of our mind. These are two different ad campaigns, two different set designers, two different photographers, but obviously they both caused major backlash and Balenciaga pulled both of the ad campaigns from social media. So Kim Kardashian, you know, longtime ambassador of the brand posted a statement on uh, her Instagram stories, her Facebook and her Twitter on Sunday saying she'll be reevaluating her relationship with the brand. Okay. So we're just keep, I'm just giving you all the information and then we're going to really dissect the details. So Balenciaga's creative director is Demna Gav. Oh, Lord. G V A S A L A. I have no idea. We're just, he goes by Demna. So we're just going to say that. Often, it says in my notes, often known by his first name only. I knew I was going to have trouble with that last name. So I just wrote that in there. He was set to receive Business of Fashion's Global Voices Award next week for using his platform to integrate socio-political issues and support marginalized people. But the publication stated on Instagram that it has since rescinded the offer. Now, Balenciaga is suing the set designer and production company for $25 million. Okay. So while the exact details of the two campaigns creation are unknown, there are three parties involved with both ads, Balenciaga, an agency called North Six, and then the two photographers, Chris Maggio and Gabrielle Gallimberti, who were both hired by Balenciaga. Balenciaga calling the inclusion of the document in the ad malevolent or at the very least extraordinarily reckless. A rep for North Six told the New York Post that the company had no creative control over the content of the ad. Chris Maggio has not made a statement. Um, obviously, we read Gabrielle's early he shot the teddy bear ad, but said he had no involvement with the spring campaign and said he had, you know, I'm rehashing this, no control over the creative content of that shoot other than the details of the lighting and the framing. Um, so essentially, Balenciaga, North Six, and the photographers are all pointing to each other as who is to blame. Um, and this point has been made over and over and over again, but it bears repeating. None of these ads would ever go to print without multiple rounds of critiques, mood boards, 
I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I do know from working in media that whoever's in charge over there at Balenciaga should not be surprised that these ads were printed. You, I mean, you can't print them without going through all the appropriate people. So anybody who is anybody at Balenciaga knew what these campaigns entailed and signed off on them, but didn't think that there would be such public backlash. Speaking of that public backlash, and this is where we're going to get into some stuff that really ticks me off. When I was doing my research about this, I, I just typed into Google Balenciaga. And what's the first article that came up? It says, what to know about Balenciaga's campaign controversy? Okay, right? By the New York Times. Sounds like something that would be useful to me, right? I click on that article. What to know about Balenciaga's campaign controversy is the title on Google. When you click it, the title then changes. And the title of the article from the New York Times is When High Fashion and QAnon Collide. Excuse me, what? First of all, I take high offense to that. Newsflash, not a member of QAnon. But just because the public is outraged by two different campaigns, all of a sudden, it's a conspiracy theory. And you want to throw the label of QAnon on it to make us all look like we've lost our minds. You're joking. You're joking. Right? The fact that the title on Google's homepage is what to know about the Balenciaga campaign controversy. And then the title changes to when high fashion and QAnon collide. Is that not the definition of gaslighting? Literally, in that article, because, you know, that just got me really riled up. It says the social media ire has moved beyond the brand to envelop swaths of the global fashion industry, including the celebrities who are often its billboard for not being more openly critical of Balenciaga's provocative marketing strategy. Provocative marketing strategy is what this New York Times article says. I'm just going to let you chew on that and, and formulate your own opinion. So who is Lada Volkova? This name has also been thrown around a lot lately. She's described as the coolest stylist in the industry by Vogue and given the it girl moniker by Dazed. Volkova has worked with some of the biggest names in fashion, including Balenciaga. She grew up in Russia, spent some time in London, but it was when she teamed up with Demna, creative director of Balenciaga and co-founder of Venomance, that Volkova became the darling of the fashion world. Her Instagram is now private, but it wasn't when the scandal broke. And in screenshots obtained by the Twitter user Curious Light, Lada Velkova posted a lot of interesting things on her Instagram. Lots of teddy bears, lots of blood-soaked interiors, lots of hunted children. Okay? So that's the type of person that's pulling the creative strings behind the scenes at Balenciaga. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at what was in these campaigns, starting with the kids and the teddy bears. First of all, there's, there's wine glasses and dog collars and duct tape, all just things that should not be in an advertisement with young children. These children looked like they were four years old. The teddy bears, you know, they, there's this, this, what is it like the, I think it's a panda eyes where it's like the teddy bears have black around their eyes. And if you Google it, it's like, that is a sign of children that have gone through traumatic experiences. And, and like I said, these are all things that are being thrown out there. You can believe whatever you want to believe. Um, sometimes when things aren't like glaringly obvious, I question it like, like that. I think, I don't know. I don't know. What is what one thing is that is glaringly obvious is this yellow duct tape that's on the ground in this ad. 
And it's the yellow duct tape that Kim Kardashian wore around her entire body that says Balenciaga. However, in the photo, you can only see part of the text on the duct tape. And it says B-A-A-L, which is not how you spell Balenciaga. Balenciaga is B-A-L-E-N, whatever, whatever. So people were like, what is B-A-L-L? What is ball? Well, you look it up and... Baal is a god worshipped in many ancient Middle Eastern communities, especially among the Canaanites, who apparently considered him a fertility deity and one of the most important gods in the pantheon. I mean, look at the look up the images. It's satanic, and I'm not afraid to say it. When Baal's mentioned in the Old Testament, most references point to a singular pagan deity. A fertility deity. And no, it's not an accident. Do you think that Balenciaga is going to allow something to go to print that has their name spelled wrong? Their name. I'm sorry. There's so many coincidences. One thing is a coincidence. Multiple things are a strategy. And there's also, you know, when when that all came out and then they came out with other ads to replace it, you know, you've seen the one where they're in the office setting and there's somebody's, um, what is it? It's like a diploma of whatever. And the name on the diploma, you look it up and that guy's into weird stuff too when it comes to children. It's like one time you can chalk it up to maybe being an accident. Two times. Three times, four times, every time you look at this picture, if you see something else that makes you raise your eyebrow, it's not a coincidence. And the New York Times is not going to label people QAnon conspiracy theorists because we're looking at what is in the ad. We're looking at what you have put in front of our faces. And at the end of the day, if you want to believe it or not, these things happen. They happen in basements. They happen in high, powerful places. They happen on Jeffrey Epstein's island. They happen, whether you want to believe it or not, whatever. So then this brand in the New York Times and even Kim Kardashian expects this, oh, it was a mistake. It's okay. It's okay. It was a mistake. And I've been trying to figure out why I am the most upset with Kim Kardashian. There are other celebrities out there that are tied to Balenciaga, Nicole Kidman, Selma Hayek, Bella Hadid. No one has spoken out against them except for Lala Kent. So I'm sitting here trying to wrap my brain around why am I most upset with Kim? And what I found is I think it's because for the past 15 years, the Kardashians have begged us to buy in buy into their shows, buy into their relationships, buy into their drama, buy into their products, buy into them as people. And I have, I've watched all the shows. I've celebrated their victories. I've watched them deal with their struggles. I felt them in their pain because they asked us to, and I bought into it. And now based on her statement, it seems like Kim Kardashian is asking us to let this one slide. This perverse, deliberately inappropriate brand slide. And why? Because she cashes their checks? And to me, that feels like a major disappointment. And honestly, to me, it feels like a reality check that while these people are on this reality show and you feel like you know them, you actually don't. You know nothing about these people. You don't know their moral values. You don't know what they would stand for when push comes to shove. Do I think it's Kim's fault? No. Do I think Kim even really owes us an apology? No, she didn't. She didn't do the ad. She wasn't in the ad. She wasn't the creative director. But is she a walking billboard for Balenciaga? Yes. And you can't pick and choose when you want to be the face of a brand. If this was Hailey Bieber and she was the face of Balenciaga and she would post it on her Instagram every other day, just as Kim does, I think people would have the same reaction to Hailey Bieber that they are Kim Kardashian. How does she even move forward from this with them? She's reevaluating their relationship. She doesn't need their money. She's a billionaire. 
She knows every time she posts a photo on her Instagram in Balenciaga, she's going to get annihilated for it. Her team are out there deleting comments left and right. You know how I know? Because I left one and it was deleted. I know we say we're above it. I And for the most part, we are. But I was feeling spicy. You know why? Because she posted this stupid picture of the stuff that's in her house. And I'm like, read the room, Kim, which is what I said. An hour later, it was deleted. I'm like, whatever. Do whatever you want. But to me, it just shows you where her headspace is. I saw this TikTok, and this guy said, if you walk into a house, let's say you go on a date with this guy. You walk into his house afterwards. You see the photo of that campaign hanging on his wall, the photo with the kids and the teddy bear. What do you do? Do you reevaluate the relationship? Or do you run for the hills? You run for the hills. So back to Becky's question. Do I think that Kim Kardashian will cut ties with Balenciaga? I think what Kim is doing, what she's actually doing, is waiting for the current creative team for Balenciaga to all be fired. Demna, Lada, whoever else turned Balenciaga into Hot Topic like a, a satanic hot topic. I think she's waiting for all of them to be wiped out. Balenciaga in my Patreon, I said, I think Balenciaga is done. I, I hope that they are, but these are powerful people with a lot of money and a lot of influence and a lot of power. So if they have a bit of a rebirth, would the, would they be able to come back from this? Maybe, maybe in a year they, they, we have a new team and we're going in a different direction because Balenciaga wasn't always this way. It didn't used to have this dark, edgy feel. It was actually quite the opposite. It used to be very classy, very regal, but then Demna took over and it turned into people walking around with garbage bags over their face. So whether all of this is just gross neglect or definitive choices, I mean, you can make your mind up about that. People deserve to lose their jobs over this. Whatever way you want to slice it, somebody's got to pay for it. And I just wish that... Ugh, I honest to God don't know what I wish... Kim would do. I just, I can't help but feel like for somebody who I've watched for 15 years, I don't actually know them at all. And it's a, a big reality check for us all, I think. So let's just wrap it up there. Ooh. I'm glad I got that off my chest though, because I was like stewing in bed, laying awake at night with all these thoughts running through my head. So hopefully now that they're out there in the universe, People might not like me for this episode, but you know what? I don't care because this is what I believe in. Now let's talk about Southern hospitality. Talk about a gear shift because we're going to review Leva Bonaparte's new spinoff show. So the series follows Southern charm resident boss lady Leva Bonaparte as she manages Charleston's very own it crowd, otherwise known as her larger than life staff at Republic Garden and Lounge. Leva and her husband Lamar own four restaurants along the city's famous King Street, but Republic is the crown jewel of their kingdom. So the first five minutes, I was like, oh, OK, I think I can take this. It had a different feel to other Bravo shows that at first I was intrigued. Um, but after the first five minutes, I wasn't really intrigued. So let's go through the cast. It's Maddie Reese, uh, Mikhail Simmons, Grace Lilly, Joe Bradley, Lucia Pena, Mia Alaria, Will Culp, Emmy Sharit, TJ Dinch, Bradley Carter, Leva Bonaparte, and of course her husband, Lamar, and they all work in Republic. Some of them work at her other restaurant, Bourbon and Bubbles, um, Everyone's drawing the Vanderpump Rules comparison because that's what it is, right? You have the boss lady, Leva, is the LVP, and then she watches over all of her staff who they're all hooking up. They all have friendship drama. They all have work drama. Um, when I, I did a review on uh, Instagram yesterday, and I was like, you know, I think I liked it. And then I woke up today, and I was like, I don't want to watch another episode. <laughs> so I think that actually tells you. It 
felt to me not like a Bravo show. It felt like an MTV show. And maybe they're trying to get Gen Z involved coming up with these younger shows. But it also doesn't feel very like Charlestonian. Um, it felt more like Los Angeles, which I mean, obviously, I know that not everybody's going to fit the Charlestonian stereotype that you see on Southern Charm, but I do think that you don't expect, you know, the staff at a bar in Charleston to look like they're getting to walk onto a Bad Bunny music video set. Like, I just wasn't mentally prepared for that. And I mean, the rumor is that none of these people actually work at Republic and that they're hired actors. I... I can't tell you that I disagree because, you know, I said the first episode has a lot of drama. It has drama between friends. It has drama between ex-boyfriends and potential new boyfriends and workplace drama. Um, But sometimes that like raises red flags for me where too much is not you can tell that it's not real when it just seems very forced, very put on. Um, But I think Bravo in general has really been trying hard to find their next Vanderpump rules. If you remember last year, they tried with candy and the gang um, candy from the real housewives of Atlanta. And this was the synopsis of that it says candy and the gang chronicles candy Todd and OLG's dynamic staff as they face a much needed change at the restaurant while juggling their career ambitions larger than life personalities and personal lives. A lot of people were confused why Leva would get the spinoff show just because she's only been in two seasons of two seasons of Southern charm. People aren't really connecting with her. I like Leva. I think she is a boss. I liked seeing her in that element, but if you um, really only know her from those two seasons of Southern charm, I can see why people would say that, especially because this last season she was not, she didn't even show up to like anything. She's like, I hate being around all these people. I don't want to film with them. So people were like, what? She's the one out of all of them to get her own spinoff show is just um, interesting. So I don't want to give an official do or don't watch it just yet because it's only one episode and you got to give it, I think, at least three. Uh, so watch the first one, decide for yourself, and then I'll tell you my predictions i guess when episode three comes out okay oh that's it i know today was a rough one but i feel like i needed to just get it off my chest i might get canceled by some people for this episode but i think a lot of people are also feeling the same way that i'm feeling and that's a little frustrated very sad and kind of wanting to see something happen so uh don't forget we're trying to reach that 500 uh review goal on Apple podcast. So if you haven't, please leave me a little review, a little five stars. If you're on Spotify, same thing. And like I said, if I'm in your Spotify rap, let us just there. No, don't forget. Uh, Patreon comes out on Friday, the bachelor brain dump. We're going to be talking about Kendall long getting engaged more about Johnny and Victoria and lots of other things. So if you're not subscribed to the Patreon yet, $3 a month for the bachelor brain dump, a uh, $5 a month for the extra pop where you would have got all my Balenciaga tea early and you get both uh, the the Monday episode and the Friday episode. So you'll love to see it. Support a sister if you can. And we'll see you back here next week. We'll love you like a sis.